I love that countdown. I know. Yep. I, I hear you. Got it. It's it's the way to start the week. I Absolutely. Mean, I need to start really. more things with that music. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Radio Cloud Native from Marantis. Every week, we break down tech news in the cloud native world and beyond. I'm Eric Gregory. And I'm Nick Chase. This week, we'll be talking about news from DockerCon, developments at Google, at Google Cloud, the latest in AI and quantum computing, and so, so much more. So, Eric, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Absolutely. So DockerCon started this week, and it's brought some significant announcements from Docker Inc. First off, they announced the beta release of a new extensions feature for Docker Desktop, along with a Docker Extensions SDK for creating new add-ons. This is one of those surprise, it's available announcements. So <laughs> you can update Docker Desktop and have a look right now. The feature is available at personal and paid tiers alike. Docker themselves developed some of the first few extensions to demonstrate the concept, adding extensions for exploring container logs and for managing disk space used by Docker. And the company also announced that a Linux version of Docker Desktop is now generally available, bringing a unified experience across Windows, Mac, and Linux. Some listeners' first thoughts probably going to be, what about Docker Engine? And that remains available. Uh, right now, Docker Desktop for Linux is available via Deb and RPM packages with support for Ubuntu, Debian, and Fedora. For the tinkerers out there, they also uh, lay the, the tantalizing clue that they're going to add support for 64-bit Raspberry Pis over the next few weeks. So oh my. something fun to look forward to there. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we always see Raspberry Pis on, on the list of tinkerers who are playing with containers. So that does not surprise me at all. All right. So uh, artificial intelligence always seems like this thing that you have to have a PhD to use, but we've got several stories this week about companies that are starting to move it into the realm of public usage. Uh, in a blog post this week, Cisco talked about predictive networks explaining uh, in some actually fairly human friendly terms about how machine learning works and talking about how this new network, uh, these new predictive networks can be used to not only uh, predict when network errors would happen, but also to remediate issues before they happen. Uh, sound familiar, Eric? Sounds like uh, Minority Report starring Tom Cruise. No, sounds like <laughs> <laughs> sounds like AI ops to me. Exactly, AI ops. I keep beating that AI ops drum. It sounds like people are listening. So, uh, yeah. So it seems like AI ops is finally inching its way towards reality. Um, I should note that this is still pretty early days here. They're only talking about predictive networks in vague terms and saying that they'll be a part of Cisco products at some point, which I completely applaud, but I would love to see something more concrete. Um, Intel is also talking about a new AI ML product, in this case focused on making it easier to do computer vision products, uh, projects rather. Uh, the register reports that, quote, Intel is pitching Sonoma Creek as an end-to-end -end AI development platform that simplifies computer vision model, model training for subject matter experts who don't have data science experience, unquote. Uh, the software makes use of Intel's open source OpenVINO toolkit, which does computer vision. Uh, and that's useful not just in terms of recognizing things like who's at your door, but also for use cases such as, you know, analyzing x-rays and, and so on. Um, one nice thing about Sonoma Creek is that it lets users improve the accuracy of the model. So, for example, if it were to misidentify a particular image, you can add additional images to the data set, uh, level them, uh, label them correctly, and, and then re-export the model. Um, kind of like, um, you know, kids game 20 questions. You ever, ever played 20 questions, Eric? <laughs> uh, well, once or twice. Okay. So... Right. There, there used to be a there used to be a a, a device that um, would play twenty questions with you, and um, it would ask the questions. And then if you stump it, it would ask you for questions that would have distinguished this uh, this object from you know whatever it thought that it was before that. So this is kind of like that. You know, you you give it more. Uh, you give it more information. I think we should use the 20 questions training model for, uh, you know, every machine learning algorithm we develop from now on. There you go. 
there you go. I, th I think that's the, <laughs> I think that's the right answer. Uh, so Alibaba has open sourced the code for Federated Scope, which is a federated tool for machine learning. There are lots of machine learning today. Uh, and this is kind of interesting because they're touting it as helping to provide privacy. Now, mm. here's why. Uh, normally, in order to train a model, you, of course, need to have a large data set. And we've talked about that on multiple occasions. But um, how can you get that large data set without combining everyone's data together? Well, the answer, it seems, is to train locally and then send the results on to be combined with the results from everyone else. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the MapReduce algorithm, which uh, where you process multiple data sets in parallel, and then you uh, combine the results. And it's important that these models and tools are getting shared because trying to do this yourself for anything of any size can require a ridiculous amount of uh, resources. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, this week, Facebook's parent company, Meta, shared the Open Pre-Trained Transformer, which is a giant language model. Uh, with uh, They shared it with academics. And the full version of this model, the OPT-175, has 175 billion parameters and took 992 NVIDIA 80 gigabyte A100 GPUs to train. Uh, and according to the register, it still took 35 attempts over two months. Wow. Um, and having, you know, tried to train models, I, you know, you never, you never can guess just how many times you have to just kind of start over. <laughs> Uh, but they're providing everything researchers need to run this model on only 16 NVIDIA D100 GPUs, only 16. Um, and the reason that they're offering this model to researchers is that these tools can be used to generate pretty convincing text, uh, especially for generic things like sports scores and, and so on. But like everything else AI related, want to guess? Uh, you know what? I, I imagine some human biases might creep in. Exactly. You're often going to get results that are biased or inaccurate, which, you know, of course they are. Um, if you are a researcher, you can apply for access to this model. Uh, but if you're not, uh, they're also providing access to the data set that they trained it on. And they are we they are providing access to a smaller data set with only 66 billion parameters. Um, I don't know how many machines it takes to actually run that, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's something. So, uh, it, it's, there's a lot of specialized hardware involved. There is indeed. And that makes a nice segue to our next story. Uh, speaking of expanding access to machine learning and AI capabilities, <laughs> Google cloud announced that VMs for tensor processing units or TPUs have reached general availability. Now, TPUs are application-specific integrated circuits developed by Google for neural network machine learning, and particularly for Google's TensorFlow AI and machine learning library. Cloud TPU VMs were first introduced last year in order to give users direct access to TPU host machines. Now, Google claims the general availability release brings greater optimization for large-scale recommendation and ranking workloads. Don't know how many of those 66 billions uh, they're going to pick up, but, you know, <laughs> you know large-scale. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So in addition to AI, uh, Google Cloud's making some moves in the edge space, right? Uh, yes. So according to Telecom TV, Google has bought the company originally set up by Deutsche Telekom to handle Mobile X, uh, an attempt to create a standard middleware layer for edge computing. Uh, the idea was that Mobile X would provide a way for, quote, federation between any standards-based mobile edge uh, computing platform, uh, unquote. And in fact, MobileX did have some success. Uh, earlier this year, they were able to interconnect with uh, the Bridge Alliance Federated Edge Hub, uh, and uh, they connected that with the Mobile Edge X Edge Cloud Platform for a successful interconnection of two multi-access edge computing or MEC platforms. Try and say that 10 times fast. <laughs> so that's cool. Uh, they also had deals with something like 26 different carry, uh, carriers, but what they didn't have was prospects to actually make money. Uh, many of the major telcos are starting to standardize on various 
public cloud platforms, which probably played a big role in, uh, in why Google felt like they needed to uh, get their own. Uh, Google has already folded Mobile X into uh, Google Cloud, but it will be open sourcing the software. So uh, it's not all about control. Uh, maybe mostly, but not all. Um, probably the closest analog you can get to this is Android in which uh, Google has open sourced the software, but largely controls it and gets a portion of the take when developers make money uh, in the Android Play Store. Presumably the idea is that uh, they'll be creating some sort of edge application store and uh, work it in the same way. So um, any, any thoughts on this, Eric? Yeah, it's interesting to see uh, this edge technology coming into the fold of one, one of our big, massive players uh, in the space, right? To see that they want to they want to have control of that, uh, that that <laughs> command and control of edge functionality <laughs> question seems to be really core. And I don't say that to be like ultra cynical about Google. You know, I, I think in a lot of ways and a lot of times they've been you know, great open source citizens. Um, yes. Uh, and as you say, it sounds like they're, uh, they want to be open sourcing this, um, but it still speaks to kind of a broader trend across the industry, right? Uh, what do you make of that? Well, uh, you know, the, the big thing, what, what's interesting is that the fact that a lot of these telcos are kind of syncing up with the various hyperscalers. Um, you know, some of them are syncing up with AWS and some of them are syncing up with Google and, and so on. Um, and uh, for, for a while, these hyperscalers were kind of the enemy. And I'm not sure exactly what this means about how everything is going to play together because it, all of the hyperscalers are essentially trying to play in this edge space. Um, and uh, how this is going to, uh, how this is going to work out um, with the phone companies, which, uh, well, phone companies, as, as if they're phone companies anymore, with the communications uh, providers. <laughs> uh, I feel so old, like I got a little, you know, rotary phone on the wall. <laughs> uh, you know, how it's going to play out with that. Um, I think we're going to come to some sort of, um, we're going to have to come to some sort of crisis point at, at some point, I think, because the thing is that there's, it's not like mobile X was the only tool out there. Starling X, um, which is another, um, another open source tool that was being worked on by wind river is already out there, uh, doing edge. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. So many of these stories end with, We'll have to see. But, I mean, that's that's it. I mean, you know. Um, so, um, Eric, talk about some security issues because we we we've, we haven't we haven't talked about the eternal security corner for a while, although uh, we have been covering it every week. Yeah, I know. Uh, it feels like we've been ominously light on major security. <laughs> disasters uh and and this isn't a disaster either this is uh this is guidance <laughs> so guidance. A, a new update to the national institute of uh, standards and technologies NIST's foundational Cybersecurity supply chain risk management guidance uh, the acronym there is cscrm uh the change aims to help organizations protect themselves as they acquire and use technology products and services the revised publication, formally titled the uh, very memorable and spicy Cybersecurity Supply Chain Risk Management Practices for Systems and Organizations. See that on the shelf and I just go, yeah, I'm going to pull it off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this provides guidance on identifying, assessing, and responding to cybersecurity risks through the supply chain at all levels of an organization. And this is all part of NIST's response to Executive Order 14028 improving the nation's cybersecurity, specifically the part about enhancing the security of the software supply chain. So, you know, I joke, but big, big important topic. Very important. It covers hardware and software protection, as well as remote attestation, and then ways in which cloud computing affects things, such as ensuring workloads are scheduled to trusted hardware, protecting keys, and so on. And you can actually download the report freely, because of course you can, it's NIST, uh, and we'll uh, provide a link there shortly. The... the uh... 
the report is actually very well organized. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who don't have kind of a security background, it's actually a really good report to kind of give you a sense of what's out there and um, what you can do and what you need to do and, and all that. Um, and at the same time, it's really very thorough because like the, the appendices are like vendor neutral things. And then it's like Intel things, AMD things, yeah. ARM things. IBM things, <laughs> like Cisco things. It's like every, you know. So um, yeah, so I I highly recommend. Uh, we we highly recommend that you go and take a look at that. Uh, I've been consistently impressed with uh, this publications in that specific regard, the way they balance accessibility and explaining a lot of the the core concepts that you need to understand, while also being really really thorough. Um, you know, we, that's another drum we beat a lot is that the usefulness of uh, the utility of this, this public guidance and, uh, you know, how even organizations that aren't necessarily uh, bound by it would be well advised to, to really study up and, and take advantage of it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue beating that drum. Absolutely true. OK. And speaking of drums that we beat a lot. OK, and take a deep breath here. Nika, you got that Chiron ready? Gonna get to it later. There it is. That's the one. Okay. So Palantir Technologies Incorporated has been selected by the Department of Health and Human Services for its five-year solutioning with holistic analytics restructured for the enterprise or share blanket purchase agreement. This $90 million BPA will allow HHS officials across the department's many agencies and missions to easily select the Palantir platform to support their work. Okay. According to the announcement, quote, Palantir Foundry enables data-driven decision-making by integrating data from siloed data sources and enabling granular access to data across various organizations. It's already used by the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Food and Drug Administration, and was also used by several military branches to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, that sounds pretty innocuous, right? Well, if the name Palantir sounds familiar, you might be thinking of it in terms of the controversy, controversies it generated several years ago in terms of privacy when the company's role in some CIA and, and immigration programs was discovered. See, Palantir maintains this huge database of, well, it feels like everybody who was ever born and probably people who haven't even been born yet, and it makes inferences based on that data to connect you to other people that you may or may not know. Now, while the reasonable part of me knows that there is no connection, I do find it particularly interesting that this story comes up at the same time as another one, and that's an NPR story regarding the electronic privacy implications of the recently linked Supreme Court draft regarding abortion rights. Now, it may seem like a huge jump, but bear with me for a moment. Now, before I say anything else, I'm not taking a stand on pro-life pro-choice, have my opinions. They're not important right now. And as always, they do not reflect those of my, my employer necessarily. But follow me here. If the Supreme Court were to remove impediments to banning abortion, several states are poised to define abortion as homicide. Now, okay. Let's say you search for where to find an abortion provider. That's data that can flag you for a potential attempted murder charge. Now, that sounds a little bit crazy, okay? But you say, well, I'm not dumb enough to do that. I'll use a private browser or I'll even use a VPN so they don't know who I am. Okay, that's fine. Think about the fact that that data has now gotten so sophisticated that the data on your credit card is enough to figure out you're pregnant, sometimes even before you do, and Palantir is there to link those credit card identities to actual people. Now, let me throw one more thing into the mix. When you use an application that stores data in the cloud, you don't own that data. I'm not a lawyer, but that's my understanding of the situation. The company owns that data, and I'm betting that when you signed it, you didn't think too much about that privacy policy. Now, think about a woman who's using a period tracker app. That app notices that she's pregnant, and then suddenly she's not. What does the company do? I guess the point here is that we need to be aware that companies are moving to this state where data is the be all and end all for companies and, and government departments. Palantir's first task order obtained under the contract 
is a 10 and a half month multi-million dollar contract to support HHS's core administrative data and applications through a vertically integrated platform that allows teams to configure low code to no code applications to manage, ingest, and access data securely across business domains, or so they say. And of course, all of this comes as just uh, just as another paragon of privacy, Clearview AI, has entered into an agreement not to sell its facial recognition technology to companies across the country after violating a prohibition against gathering people's biometric data, that would be their faces, without permission. Of course, that's a law only in Illinois, so only, only Illinois residents can opt out of the Clearview AI database, and that database can still be sold to law enforcement at both the state and federal level, except in Illinois. So great that random companies can't target you using your face on, say, a closed circuit TV camera, but the government and law enforcement still can. Now, I wrote the story last night to deliver it this morning, and when I woke up, I had a Time Magazine story in my mailbox that brought up even more troubling privacy issues, which include the fact that both data brokers and law enforcement can request geofenced information that shows everyone who's in a particular location, say a family planning clinic, during a particular time based on location data from your phone. But Time also talks about some legislative efforts that are attempting to tamp this down. Time talks about how Senator Ron, uh, oh, Senator Ron, wow, I can't remember, I can't, I, Senator Ron Wyden, I lost, <laughs> I lost his name in there. Senator Ron Wyden's Mind Your Own Business Act, quote, from 2019 would create new cybersecurity and privacy policies that digital platforms must abide by and provide means for customers to see both the data that has been collected on them and with which parties it has been shared. In 2021, Wyden also introduced a bill alongside Re Senator uh Rand Paul of Kentucky, the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act, which would close a legal loophole that allows data brokers to sell individuals' personal information to law enforcement and intelligence agencies without court oversight, unquote. Uh, Congress, Congresswomen, uh, uh, quote, Congresswomen Anna Eshu and Zoe Lofgren have introduced their online privacy act. Oh, this is not a quote, um, which would give individuals the right to access, fix, or delete their data. And Eshu's banning surveillance advertising act restricts advertisers from targeting individuals based on data collected about them on the theory that if you can't use it to make money, there's no point in collecting it. Okay. That is a whole lot to unpack. Okay. A whole lot. So I, 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 I want to make it clear here again, this is, this is not a political discussion except that we're talking about digital privacy um, here. Okay. And the potential stakes of losing that privacy for a long time, we've, we've had people say, oh, well, you know, who cares if there's no privacy? You know, I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, okay. Um, but, you know, who decides what's wrong? You know, what happens when, you know, somebody decides that, you know, uh, it's illegal to smoke or drink or, you know, play pool or, or whatever. And they start requesting, um, you know, geofenced information about, you know, who was near the, the bar or the pool hall or, you know, whatever. I mean, this is, this is a lot of information. I mean, what's your opinion, Eric? Yeah, no, as you said, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, but kind of following up on what you were just saying, there's immensely complex output of our digital lives, and then that becomes the the, the grounds for further developments in the industry and and just in in our society, right? Um, so you know, we we produce these massive volumes of data, and we have for a long time. There are huge uh, business incentives for, for business entities to collect that data. And then increasingly uh, states are realizing that they're pretty interested in that too. Um, and, you know, we, we've kind of, I think the average person has gotten pretty accustomed to, as you alluded to, kind of clicking through the privacy policy, right? It's, it's something that just, we don't instinctually process that what we're generating is 
data that isn't necessarily super time limited and isn't isn't bound to the people who are collecting it. So, you know, what I did on Facebook 10 years ago uh, likely persists in some form. Um, you know, useful inferences can be drawn from it. And crucially, people other than Facebook might have that data. Um, and we just don't think that way. Uh, I think it, it's similar to the way that we we really struggle to think about exponentiation because we don't we don't really encounter it like local locally tangibly in our own individual lives. So we, we just struggle to process it. It's a similar <laughs> idea here. Um, the 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 persistence and the ubiquity and the uh, difficulty of binding this, the the, the data that we generate um, is not something I think we we grasp intuitively, even when we know intellectually that it's the case. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, attempts at the state level to try to grapple with that. Um, sometimes through regulation that would protect individuals, perhaps sometimes uh, through trying to use that data and <laughs> to, to X, Y, or Z end, right? Um <laughs> And certainly we see uh, all manner of businesses with, you know, varying degrees of, of good or ill faith trying to make use of it. Yeah, it, it's true. And and I think it's a lot like what we talked about last week. You know, it's it's an arms race. If we, you know, if we start banning the use of certain kinds of data, other kinds of data will come to the fore. But, you know, I, we can't just do nothing. You know, we have to, we have to do something at some point. All right. So, um, what, what else is going on, Eric? You know, speaking of things that are hard to intuitively understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one's good. You got that one. Uh, at IBM's Think 2022 event, the company made a bold assertion that they will launch a 4,158 qubit quantum computer by 2025. So, okay, we're on to quantum. And that's a number, 4,158. What, what, what are we supposed to do with that number? Let's put it into a little bit of context. In a quantum computer, the most basic unit of information is a quantum bit or a qubit. So if you're building a quantum computer, you need a way to create and maintain and use stable qubits. And eventually you need to be able to do that at scale. So today's bleeding edge quantum computers are operating in the range of like one to 150 qubits. That's, that's sort of the territory we're, we're occupying. And some experts suggest that a quantum computer will need thousands or even into the millions of qubits to start being really, really useful. Now, again, we're in the infancy of this technology. So right now we see different organizations taking different approaches to the core question of how do we create and manage qubits? Some companies like IonQ are using trapped ions, which hold information effectively, but are difficult to scale. IBM is using qubit superconductors with niobium, and Google is taking a somewhat similar approach to IBM. Still others, like Intel, are looking to use silicon, uh, you know, the old and, old and trusty silicon, uh, which has <laughs> historically had higher rates of error for qubits, but, you know, it's, it's something we're used to scaling in classical computers. Uh, and just this year, there's actually been some promising research on avoiding errors with silicon with uh, some uh, uh, error correction routines. So among the current players, IonQ has a 32-qubit trapped ion system. At the end of last year, Rigetti debuted an 80-qubit multi-chip processor, and IBM currently has their 127-qubit Eagle system. And it's important to note those numbers don't necessarily track one-to-one -one because of varying error rates among the different system models, but they give you an idea of the territory we're in. So the news here is that IBM is betting on using a quantum classical hybrid approach to bump up that qubit number way beyond what we've seen so far. Essentially, they intend to link together a bunch of quantum computers via classical computers, maybe a little bit of duct tape as well, and they seem to be going <laughs> all in on this philosophy of quantum and classical machines working together. Next year, they plan to introduce, uh, quote, serverless quantum computing, unquote, where their cloud system will decide how to distribute users' requests between quantum and classical machines. Meanwhile, the White House is watching the state of play in quantum closely, announcing last week that it will move the National Quantum Initiative Advisory Committee, an independent expert body, to report directly to the White House. From the announcement, they appear to be particularly interested in quantum computing from a cryptography and national security perspective, which we've talked about before, but also they seem to be interested in how the technology might support advances in electric car charging and even fusion energy, so uh, some kind of bigger infrastructure questions. 
So, Nick, what do you make of IBM's announcement and kind of the, the, the White House move and the general state of play here? Well, you know, I think that um, IBM, if IBM says that they're going to do that in three years, I kind of think they probably will. Although, you know, three years just seems like a ridiculously short period of time to go from 127 to 4,158. Although 4,158 sounds like an insanely precise number <laughs> you know it's like it's you know we're we're so used to kind of you know digital numbers you know 127 you know i i can understand that you know it's like zero based 128 i got that yeah. you know but 4158 that uh, okay you know <laughs> if 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 you say so that's you know that that makes that i'll i'll take your word for it I'll take your word for it. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I do understand why they're kind of really kind of freaking out. No, I shouldn't say freaking out, but they should probably be freaking out just a little bit over at the White House. Um, you know, I mean, we this issue of, you know, when we get to the point that quantum computing can crack encryption, uh, you know, I mean, so the, at least they're taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, at yeah. least they're taking it seriously. Although, you know, it, it's funny when you think that encryption is just not that old in the in the grand scheme of things. You know, I mean, we've we haven't been really securing we haven't been securing things via encryption for really all that long. Maybe what yeah. you know, thirty years as as a general rule. Um, you know, I mean, I remember when I when we were first having to learn about what what is public key encryption, you know, and, and all of that, uh, you know, again, I'm old, um, but, you know, it, it hasn't been that long. And it's like encryption. We hardly knew you. You know, yeah, and I think if you, even if you expand the definition, you know, right, we're going back like a century. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Um, exactly. So. <laughs> Go ahead. This is a silly point, but I, I couldn't help but be reminded in the sort of um, infinitely rising, not infinitely rising, the, the slowly rising qubit counts and the sort of competitive qubit counts uh, announced by by various players. I couldn't help thinking of like the '90s console wars between like Nintendo and <laughs> Sega and Sony. How everyone would <laughs> would uh, you know excitedly announce that okay, we've got a 32 bit console, we've got a 64 bit console, uh, and eventually the console makers stopped using those numbers because they were always a little reductive. You know, they, they, they tracked somewhat to the, the power of those machines, but uh, eventually the, the much greater complexity of the components going into the, the, the results that you get and the kinds of experiences you got from the games, you know, we, we realized that one number didn't capture it. And I, I kind of wonder <laughs> when quantum is going to hit that. I mean, obviously the rise in qubits is important, not downplaying that. Uh, but, um, yeah, I think, I think some of the, some of the richness and, and the detail of these varying models and their kind of competing benefits and, and, um, drawbacks gets obscured a little bit and having this one number that's really easy to focus on, especially for business purposes, right? Especially to say, all right, in three years, we're going to have, X. uh, pl please invest, uh, <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, it's it's true. It's it's very true. So anyway, um all right. Uh by the way, um you know, before we before we jump into in, into anything else, we should say hi to actually we have live people on well, this broadcast. We do. We have uh I I I'm, I'm going to mispronounce your name and I'm so sorry, but uh Ma Majid Rafi uh, yes, I guess. Hi, everyone. Majid Rafi and, and Grace Shin. Hey, G hey, Grace. Thanks for joining us. And, and Majid, thank you guys. Um, I mean, I think we probably have more live people than that, but those are live people who have actually commented. So I wanted to say hi to you guys. So, um, we, we, we always like to see that there are actually people listening to us and we're not just shouting into the, into the void. Um, anyway, um, 
Yeah, but I, I think you're right. It, it's a little bit reductionist to bring it down to a specific number, particularly when, um, you know, there are so many different, uh, different technologies uh, going on. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I got, I got nothing else on that. I'm ready to move on to, uh, to wackadoodle. All right. Uh, well, finally, as per usual, we will close out today with Wackadoodle, the segment where Nick quizzes me on news of the week that might be surprising, absurd, or just reminds us what a weird Wackadoodle world we live in. Now, sometimes I like to mix it up and turn the quiz back on Nick. So, Nick, I've got a particularly cloud native flavored story for you this week. All right. Can't wait. Let's hear it. Woo. Okay. Well, last week. <laughs> Last week, a post trended on Hacker News walking through the process of deploying a Kubernetes cluster using what programming language? Oh, I remember seeing something about this. Um, 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 the, okay, they, they were, I don't think I actually knew what language it was, but I remember it was a ridiculous programming language uh, posting... Um, they, they were doing it in, uh, basic. Oh, good guess. But I was looking for Fortran. The answer Fortran. was Fortran. Oh my goodness gracious. Fortran. <laughs> there were a number of other, uh, possible answers actually, including Perl. This comes from a post by Pulumi's Lee Briggs titled deploying Kubernetes clusters in absurd languages, where <laughs> Briggs observes that YAML is a superset of JSON. So if you can get valid YAML or JSON out of a language, you can theoretically provision infrastructure as code with it. He describes the yeah. exercise as useless and quote a bad idea and i enjoyed it very much <laughs> you know what you you useless and i enjoyed it very much is sounds like a fantastic way to spend an afternoon or <laughs> a week or a month as it happens so um yeah definitely uh, i i can't i i can't disagree with that i cannot <laughs> i cannot disagree with that but yeah i mean i suppose that's definitely uh it's definitely a good point yaml is a superset of json so yeah any language you can get json out of you should be able to uh you should be able to provision kubernetes that makes perfect sense apparently he was able to uh spin up some uh resources for fortran to output json like really really quickly just using like homebrew on a mac so uh i, I want to try that out maybe i mean <laughs> Yeah, it sounds yeah. useless and, and uh, delightful. It does. It's useless and delightful. A, a, another nice way to spend a, a, an afternoon. Useless and delightful. Um, okay, cool. Well, um, so uh, let me let me jump in here with with my wackadoodle. So um, let's see. So uh, this past week we learned about a uh, a an error that would crash Google Docs when a particular thing happened. Do you know what that particular thing is? When a particular thing happened. I, I, I'm a little like you on the last one. I, I know the broad contours of this story, but I don't know what the trigger was. Yeah, go, go ahead so, and tell me. Okay, so when someone would type the following string, Nika, hit us with it. Oh, I put it in the private chat, Nika. Drop it on this. Drop it in the uh, as a header, please. There we go. No, 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 no. Got to do it. Got to do it correctly. <laughs> Got to do it correctly. No, I'll tell you why in a minute. Well, it's got to have five ands like that so and 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 the, the beautiful song of the universe and, yes. and 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 exactly but they have to be exact that's it right there so it has to be exactly like that exactly capitalized like that so like if you that's why i said it has to be exactly right but it turns out that so it seems that the grammar checker in google in google docs was completely freaking out over this phrase or well, it's not really a phrase, but that's the point is it's not really a phrase, but then it turns out that you could crash it with the same thing only using, but instead of, and, and 
then it turns out that you could also reproduce it with the words also, therefore, anyway, who, why, besides, and whoever, or I'm sorry, however. Uh, you could also crash it with although, besides, moreover, firstly, secondly, thirdly, and fourthly, but not fifthly and beyond, according to the register. So, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, just Google Docs has become so sort of <laughs> ubiquitous that we don't think about <laughs> <laughs> you just did. So there, Nika wrote, not going to make a butt joke. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so <laughs> to call it the Chomsky glitch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, so that is, so that is the latest, uh, the latest thing you can use to, uh, crash something of it. Apparently Google was, um, they they acknowledged the uh, the issue in uh, pretty quickly, and uh, they're working on getting it uh, getting it fixed. So uh, they should be. Uh, I'm sorry they've they've fixed it, and uh, hopefully it'll all be completely. I mean, it, it's not something you're going to come up with. The question is, what I want to know is, how did somebody find it? You know, I had the almost the opposite feeling. I was shocked it took that long uh just as i think um i'm used to to writing out uh you know fragmented phrases over and over like but 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 <laughs> maybe that's gonna... maybe that's just the weird rhythms of my brain but uh... i don't know i was gonna say how bad does your writer's block have to be for you to come up with that I mean, that's, so, it's the shining style uh, sitting there at the typewriter, uh, same thing over and over, but you know, Google Docs now. I guess, I guess so. All right. Well, short show today. I, um, I, I thought I was going to uh, pontificate more, but it's probably good that I did not. <laughs> So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thanks for joining us live, uh, Grace and, and Majid, and, and everyone else who uh, is, is here uh, with us live who is quiet. Um, and thank you all to, uh, to all of you who join us, both uh, video on demand and to those who get us uh, on the uh, audio podcast. You can find us on... Um, yeah, you know what? I don't know where you can find us right now, but we'll get that information for next week. Next week, we'll have all that. But you can follow us on LinkedIn and uh, you can get all the information on the next episode. And we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. you, Eric. Bye. And thank you, Nika. Bye-bye. <laughs>